Stand by for terminal count. Overlook Horizon High Altitude Balloons, an Ontario County nonprofit. This is no ordinary balloon. What a view! Over 110,000 feet. This is incredible. Five, four, three, two, one. Watch. Hey guys, Tori here from Overlook Horizon, coming to you live today from the Rochester, New York area here in Canadagua for Overlook Horizon 10. Boy, I'm looking kind of dark. I do have lights. I should have turned the lights. Uh, but we're live here today. We're getting ready. Everything seems to be on track and going on or going well so far. So things are good. Uh, we're getting ready. Uh, we've got about an hour and five minutes here until we actually go to uh, till we actually do this launch here. So um, take you through kind of uh, we got a little bit of buffer time here. Uh, it is an experimental payload today, so never done this before uh, in terms of this launch sequence. So hopefully we got it timed out okay that we actually launch at T minus um, zero, but that. Is uh, that's a bit of an experiment as well because we've never gone through you know done the actual launch here. So I expect that we we'll, that we will be on um, on track, but we'll see what happens today. So I will turn. I got lights here. I don't know why I didn't turn them on. I will turn them on in a minute so you can actually see my face. But um, but just to take you through here, uh, what we're going to actually do. Um, so about 45 minutes. T minus. These are all the T minus times. So T minus. 45 minutes. Uh, that's when I'm going to start filling the balloon here and get things up and running for the actual uh, lift vehicle. And then uh, at about 20 minutes, we're going to uh, verify signal reception for the payload, make sure everything's good to go. We got to do some FAA notifications. That happens about T minus 15 minutes. We have to notify uh, Rochester Track On, that's the Rochester Airport Tower uh, approach and departures. Uh, we also have to notify Cleveland Center FAA. Uh, that's the uh, that's the upper altitude uh, center that manages all the commercial traffic that's flying overhead. So they're getting notifications uh, about T minus 15 minutes prior to launch. They will be tracking it, um, so they are uh, they're following along as well. I already talked to them a couple times today, uh, and then uh, then we're it's going to count right back right down to T minus zero. We should have a launch and hopefully. Everything tracks and goes well. So in terms of the launch here, we are, it's a bit breezy out. It's cold as well, uh, but it's a bit breezy. Uh, we got about, uh, we're getting 15 mile per hour gusts. So I'm actually inside here, uh, this garage area so that we can actually protect the balloon, makes it a little bit easier to fill. With this micro payload, uh, we're doing, uh, it's a little bit low key in terms of the actual launch event itself, because this is experimental. We want this, this, uh, miniature payload to actually go on other flights as a backup or maybe some interesting weather patterns. So the idea here is uh, it's a little bit low key. We're still treating it like a normal launch here, but a little bit low key in terms of the actual launch event. And then hopefully everything can track well here. I, this is bothering me that I can't see my face. Let me see if these lights do any better. One second. <laughs> Let's turn these things on. I don't know uh, if this is going to actually do anything. And I am still hooked up to the microphone, so hopefully... So I believe you can still hear me. And I'm gonna try to stay mic'd up the entire time. Uh, and one, one thing that I didn't mention here today is that I am operating solo today. So I talked about, there we go, is that any better? Can you see my face? Eh, a little bit. Um, so I talked about uh, how it's a little bit of a low key launch. Uh, so that along with that, or it's midweek, middle of the day, the actual launch event itself, I'm gonna be doing solo here, the uh, recovery, may have some help on the recovery still up in the air but uh so i'm gonna actually launch solo today uh, which is another reason why i'm keeping it inside the garage area here to it's a little bit harder to fill the balloon and get an accurate lift measurement once you get uh, outside to the elements especially with 15 mile per hour gusts so the summertime when the winds come down any that if you're less than 10 miles per hour is usually ideal and less than 10 miles per hour that's the constant winds and the gusts so uh, we want to stay below that 10 mile per hour mark when we're doing it outside so um, so I do see all your comments coming through. I do want to say hi to everybody. I see Larry on Facebook. Good to see you, Larry. Thanks for hanging out with us. See a whole bunch of people on the YouTube machine. Uh, let's see, Willie, has it been a bump to 1600? Yep, we did have to bump it. Bump this flight to 1600. We'll take a look at some of the predictions here in just a minute. But bumped it to four o'clock. Um, four o'clock, and that's uh, 20. 
hundred. How do you, how do you say twenty hours in military time? Twenty hundred. Uh, that's Zulu time, UTC time, Greenwich Mean Time. But anyways, uh, so yeah, four o'clock Eastern time. We had to bump it, get a little safer landing zone. It's also going to keep it close by. Take a look at predict predictions in just a minute. Um, Love the lobster. Yeah, I had a lobster shirt on earlier. We did our canary launch, which is just a regular party balloon. Throw it up in the air. Just make sure that it's going in the direction that we want it to go so that I don't hit some houses that are behind me. Um, let's see. Hashtag space shrimpy. Yeah, so I'm going along with the, the hashtag space lobster theme here. It's a micro payload, little itty bitty 100 gram payload. And so uh, I've been throwing around the hashtag space shrimp or Space Shrimpy on uh, Twitter. So if you're watching along and you're on the Twitter machine, give us a little hashtag Space Shrimp and uh, send us, uh, if you got any interesting or funny pictures to go along with it, I love seeing those. So, so send those over with hashtag Space Shrimp um, and we'll take a look at it. Uh, let's see, everything is on track. Gregorius, good to see you. Uh, here we go, hashtag Space Lobster, Willie Ahoy. Uh, what's going to be launched today? Uh, this, so this is our micro payload. This is actually our high altitude balloon flight. Uh, let's see. Is the lobster going up today? No, no lobster today. That will be on one of our larger payloads that actually has cameras on it. This one does not have any cameras on board. I know, no cameras. What's the point of that? Well, this is an experimental one. We're trying to use this for other things, so we, got, we want to make sure it works on its own here. So. So no cameras today and therefore no lobster. That will be likely somewhere around like the May time frame that we'll actually put the lobster on board. So um, let's see, uh, Leia says no, oh no, I'm assuming that's a space lobster she's talking about. Only a hundred gram payload, yep, that's right. Send a live cam on the balloon, I would love to. We're gonna work on that, probably won't be this year, maybe next year, but we got a lot of work to do before we get there, so. Um, let's see, what, uh, will you launch the sky lo the space lobster? Yep, May time frame is what we're looking at. Um, zero, t Andrew Murphy says zero two, zero, is that zero 2000 or zero 2000 or 0-2000? I, I don't know how to say 20 hours in military time when it's 20 zero, zero. It's That's a weird one for me, but anyway, Shrimpy goes up today. Yeah, little guy, um, cannot wait, will be great. Zero 2000 hour. All right, I'll buy it. 2,000, sure. Uh, what is that packet going out? So that the packet that you're hearing, that's the radio signal here. That's the little chirp that, uh, that, that chirp right now is from the chase vehicle, uh, which is my car. Um, so that's chirping out its position right now. Uh, once we get the payload online in a few minutes, that will also chirp out. So those will increase in frequency, but you'll hear that little radio chirp, the packet, the air, that's an APRS positioning transmission. And that's what we're using to actually track the balloon. We also do the uh, chase vehicle so that if you guys track it online at overlookhorizon.com slash map, you'll be able to see where our chase vehicle is and where the balloon is, hopefully if everything goes well. We'll see. Um, so let's see, how far can the balloon travel? Well, if you pick the wrong day, it can go from Rochester, New York out to Maine and high winds. We picked the right day. So today's flight is actually, let's, that's a good, great segue. We're gonna take a look at the predictions. I only got a few minutes before I gotta start, so I'm kind of flying through it here. Um, so here we go, this is what we're looking at for our flight prediction here. So the dot that's on the very bottom of this little squiggly graph here, the one that's on the bottom, that's our launch site. That's where we are lifting off from, um, right just outside of Canandaigua, New York. A lot of times this thing just goes up and goes east and just goes with the wind. Hits a jet stream and it just goes off. I guess in the camera it's this way, but I'm backwards mirrored. Um, so, um, Let's see. Oh, Todd King says. Todd King says I only see one viewer, sometimes two. Where are you seeing all those people? So, in case you're confused, we are streaming on Facebook and YouTube at the same time. Uh, we do. It looks like our Facebook stream is a little bit on the light side. You got to share it. Invite your friends. Get them on board here. But uh, the YouTube stream going strong with our uh, with our hashtag Space Lobster Nation. <laughs> I don't know what. To, um, so anyways, um, so a lot of times you see the flight just go up and it heads to the east and just goes with the jet stream. Today's kind of an interesting flight pattern because we got that nor'eastern coming in. So we're seeing winds out of the northeast, meaning they're going from northeast to southwest. So you get a little bit of an interesting flight pattern. So we're actually going to take off and for one of a rare occasion, we're going to head southwest on takeoff. And then, so that's pretty rare. Usually we go east, northeast, nor uh, 
uh, southeast, things like that. But this is going southwest, pretty unusual. Then it's going to make a big U-turn, head back to the northeast, new layer of atmosphere there. Going to head up to about 75,000 feet. Low, this is going to be our lowest maximum altitude yet. So we're, we're staying pretty low in the atmosphere, but experimental, so that's what we're doing. Then it will burst, and then it's going to do a complete mirror image of that. It's going to fall down. It's going to head a little bit to the northeast, make that U-turn, go back to the southwest. And right now, this latest prediction is putting our landing only about three and a half miles from where I'm standing right now, which is crazy. Our shortest downrange recovery yet is five miles, 5.01. That was on Overlook Horizon 8. So if we hit anything less than 5.01 today, then that will be our shortest downrange recovery record for us personally here. So, um, so that's what we're looking. That's not our goal, but could be an interesting uh, achievement uh, on a side note here. So, oh, everybody's tell telling me how to do uh, 20 hundred. Is everybody saying, all right, 20 hundred? It just sounded weird to me, but I'll go with that. Everybody seems to think 20 hundred. So, that's what we'll go with. So, so anyways, that's our flight prediction for today. Um, and then, let's see, one other thing. So, this is, this is a single prediction. It's likely not going to do this exact same thing. The shape should be about the same, but the exact path, not so much. This is plus or minus, usually when we go east, a lot of times it's plus or minus 15 miles. Probably a little bit smaller for today, but that gives us kind of a, a landing zone of uncertainty here, which is what this one is. And this is actually a little bit off because this prediction software that I use to generate this heat map, the smallest parachute that it would let me choose is a three foot parachute. And our parachute today is only 18 inches because it's a little, little bitty tiny payload. So. 18 inch payload so this is actually probably showing the zone of uncertainty of a little bit too far to the west so likely this will probably bump over just a little bit to the east from what you see on this zone of uncertainty here but that's kind of what we're looking at um, so about three to six seven miles away is what we're expecting so um so i i love doing these broadcasts but i'm nervous about today for a couple reasons and this is always the worst part for me is it just gets so nerve-wracking trying to get this thing up but um, one never done this payload before experimental no reason to believe that it won't work but I don't know um, number two there is no backup on board so usually we fly our regular payload there's our primary flight computer and we've got a backup GPS system that saved us more times than I care to admit but uh, this one has no backup because it's literally just a little tiny circuit board. It's just the circuit board. I've got uh, it's over there. I'll show it before we actually launch, and then uh, and then just the parachute, and that's it. That's it. So uh, we got zero backup here. So if it fails, that's it. Our backup is the label on it that's got our phone number on it. So we'll see what happens. Um, Let's see, uh, so yeah, I see everybody's comments coming in. Definitely let me know questions, things like that along the way. So in about one minute here, I'm gonna play what's our, our intro video. It was put on, on YouTube, so you might've seen that already, but it's our mission details, kind of shows what's uh, what the plan is for today. It's about four minutes or so. Uh, and that's gonna give me a little bit of buffer time when I start that to get started with the filling procedure. So we intend to to fire up the helium at about the T minus 45 minute mark. Um, and I do, uh, I mean, I think we're in good shape here, so I wanna get uh, get things up and running. So we'll play that mission details uh, video here in just a moment. That will explain what we're doing today. A lot of it I covered already, but that's my formal thing in case I forgot anything. So uh, one downside, my live broadcast software was having an issue with my my remote camera that I usually use. So normally I have the camera you're looking at here, then I have a second one, and the, what the plan was to have the second one outside so you can actually see the, the balloon launch. Um, that's not gonna happen. So this one is fixed, kind of. My plan is when we launch, I'm gonna try to pull it down here and at least walk over there. It's wired, so I can't go very far, but at least walk over there and point it to the sky so maybe we, maybe we can see something for the balloon once we launch. I'm gonna work on something better for next time, but technology failed me today for the live broadcast, so. Willie, wish I could come help for the recovery. What kind of changes do you have, in, have to make in cold weather like this? Uh, really, there's not much that we do for cold weather because the upper atmosphere is super cold. So 
that's uh, that's going to be way colder than anything ground level. It's 32 degrees here, but this is going to hit negative 75, negative 80 degrees in the upper atmosphere. So, uh, so this 32 degrees, although my fingers are freezing, is nothing that the, compared to what the balloon's going to see. So, not much really that we have to do. And that that cold temperatures in the upper atmosphere, those will happen when it's a 90 degree day in the summer too. So. Um, so this is ju we're just seeing surface temperatures here that uh, that are cold, and the only changes we really have to make is I got to wear a heavier jacket. So, um, all right. So I will I will get back to some of these questions. Hope the battery lasts in the cold weather. Yeah, we are using some lithium energizer batteries that should last to very very cold temperatures, but yeah, that that's definitely a concern of mine as well is those cold temperatures. So that is one thing we're going to be watching out for today. So. All right, I got to get started, at least getting things ready to go, get the balloon out. We'll, we'll kick off the helium in just a moment. I'm going to throw this, uh, the intro video here that has our, our mission details. You come back, it'll bring you back here in about four minutes. Um, and then we'll, we're going to fill the balloon. Hopefully I have a little buffer time after filling the balloon. We can talk some more, answer some more questions. So don't go anywhere. Keep firing me your questions. When I get breaks, I'll definitely come check them out. And uh, we got uh, about 48 minutes and we'll get this thing in the air, hopefully. That's the plan. All right, check this out. We'll see you in a couple minutes. Let's get some balloons in the air. It's time for the first flight of 2018. Overlook Horizon 10 is launching today. <laughs> Hey guys, Tori here from Overlook Horizon. It's flight day for our first flight of 2018, Overlook Horizon 10, nicknamed Shrimpy. The name Shrimpy for this flight represents today's primary mission, which is utilizing our brand new miniaturized flight computer system that will provide radio positioning reports back to us on the ground throughout the flight. In previous flights, we've used a much larger Arduino Mega Base platform that provided not only radio broadcasted positioning reports, but also performed battery monitoring, camera control, sensor readings for temperature and pressure, along with data recording onto an onboard SD card. Today's flight though is scaled way back. It's based around a tiny 3.3 volt Arduino Pro Mini, but still contains the same core functionality to relay GPS positioning reports, along with readouts of the flight's altitude, temperature, pressure, humidity, and battery level. This flight does not contain an onboard SD card and it will not feature any onboard cameras. So what's the point? Well. This will be an alternative tracking platform to our larger tracking system. We're still keeping that larger Arduino Mega Base system and that will be utilized multiple times this year for our larger flights with onboard cameras. We'll be using this miniaturized platform for other things like a secondary tracking method for our larger flights as well as a standalone system for riskier or experimental flight conditions where we might not get the payload back. Just like the Radioson flights performed over 200 times every day by the U.S. National Weather Service, this flight will feature a set of onboard weather sensors similar to what they would use when determining our daily weather forecasts. With any luck, we'll be able to generate a skew T graph after the flight, just like the National Weather Service, and see how our graph compares to theirs. Ultimately, we hope to further this platform into an expendable payload where we can launch flights similar to the National Weather Service into interesting weather patterns while not having to worry about recovery efforts. This platform is a lot less expensive, but we're not quite to the point where we consider it a completely expendable platform. There are still a few cost-saving measures we'd like to implement, but this is the first step. Until then, we'll still be attempting to recover this one. This new tracking system weighs in at only 100 grams, which is less than 10% of what our usual payload weighs. Since this flight does not have any onboard cameras and it's experimental, we're going with a much smaller 200 gram balloon today to keep the flight short. Without any onboard cameras, it's not really essential to reach a super high altitude, so this flight is expected to only reach about 75,000 feet, which still sets a new record for us at the lowest maximum altitude yet. This payload is also flying completely exposed to the elements. Usually our flight computer is encased within a styrofoam cooler, which keeps some of the heat contained so things don't get too cold. This payload has no thermal protection and will be completely exposed to temperatures down to almost negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Whew. There's a little bit of conformal coating on the boards to protect from minor moisture issues, but other than that, it's just a bare circuit board with some lithium batteries that will hopefully provide power throughout those frigid temperatures. Lastly, another experimental portion of today's flight is the parachute. This flight is so lightweight that a parachute is almost not even necessary as the balloon fragments alone would likely be enough to slow down the payload 
just from aerodynamic drag. However, we're not going to take any chances, so we're including a tiny 18-inch parachute in line with today's flight. Our tests to date, though, indicate that even this tiny parachute may cause too much drag, so we may be seeing some extended downrange drifting today while the flight is under parachute. This extra horizontal drifting means we're at an increased chance of getting snagged in a tree, so hopefully we can avoid that if possible. So that's what's happening today. It's a smaller flight to kick off the 2018 season, but we're still excited to get started with something new. This is the first of at least five planned flights for this year, but we'll likely be doing more than that if the weather allows for it. So make sure you're following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay up to date on those flights. Also, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any of our live broadcasts, our in-flight videos, or the educational series videos that we do in between flights. So what do you guys think about today's flight? Do you think this thing will work? Will our flight computer freeze in the frigid mid-flight temperatures? Will we get stuck in another tree? We'll all find out together soon, but let us know what you think in the comments section down below. I'll try to answer as much as I can during the live broadcast today, but with this flight being small and experimental, I'll be operating solo today. This is also a midday and midweek launch, so it's tough to get a flight crew together, but I'll do my best to keep you updated as much as I can during the launch procedures. I'll be preparing the flight for launch soon, so let's head back to the launch site, hopefully to see a successful launch today for Overlook Horizon 10 Shrimpy. All right, you guys are back. Yeah, so that went a whole lot faster than I expected, but it's a little itty bitty tiny balloon today. Hopefully you can still hear me, I think, yeah. So, little itty bitty tiny balloon today. That filled in about one minute. <laughs> normally, normally I set aside about 20 minutes for that operation, um, but we're gonna tie it off here now. So that was pretty darn quick. So, little itty bitty tiny balloon today. I mean, it looks, looks large. You can't really see me behind it, but this is definitely much smaller than we normally do here. So. So if you ever do weather balloon launches yourselves, here's how we seal it up. A lot of people ask us this question. And since I'm wearing the microphone, which I don't normally wear, I get to actually answer this. This is hard to do when you're solo. But we twist the neck of the balloon. We got some zip ties. And the idea is hopefully we don't poke the balloon with the zip tie and poke a hole in it. But so we twist the balloon so it's all it's sealed on its own just by the twisting and then the first heavy duty zip tie here keeps it wrapped up and oh generally well here's a tip for you that I just failed at you're supposed to make sure so I have two jugs here which I'm sure people will ask about but the two jugs are represent a, fit, a lift line which is measuring how much pull the balloon has and that one is this one here that's hanging and that we actually no longer need so we're going to make sure we cut the right line and free the lift jug and that leaves only our safety jug here which is basically preventing the thing from flying away if I let go now normally when you tie off the balloon when you do that first zip tie you want to include the safety line which I failed to do so what we're gonna do so we're gonna do another another zip tie here so that we can get the loop of the safety line in and actually get that guy included and then the whole trick here is like I said you don't want any of these little extra bits poking a hole in the balloon so I'm really trying hard to make sure that doesn't happen and I'm all tangled here we got a mess let's see get off of here so I don't want to let it zip tie to the the green fill line right now and I do not want to let that zip tie off until I'm certain that it is the balloon is still attached to the safety weight all right so that's where we are now so now the balloon 
it's attached to the safety weight so just in case I accidentally let go we're still good and now I'm all twisted here so somehow I need to make sure when I cut this zip tie that I don't actually cut the payload line I think we're okay here I think I, think I got a path to it that zip tie is free and we got a little bit of duct tape holding it to the fill line here get that off and get it off the hose stuck on here come on get off it got all during the filling there got all twisted so there's that one of these is our fill line, which is this guy here. We can make sure I'm cutting the right one. We're gonna cut this guy. No, no, I guess I can't cut it with that. I'm on scissors. Oh, there it goes. Came down on its own. All right, so then the balloon can come off the fill line because it is completely sealed at this point. I'm going to make sure, usually I loop this on first, but the payload line has a loop on the end. But it was all twisted up, so I just wanted to take it off. So we'll get this loop over the neck of the balloon. And the last thing we do here is we fold the balloon up into kind of a U-shape. And we're going to throw one more zip tie. One more zip tie on here. Gotta make sure I get my payload loop in there. Now there's a bunch of different ways that you can fill this. I'm kind of just talking to myself. I can't see any of your comments yet, but we'll take a look at them in a minute. You can tell me how much you think this is awful or if you think I'm doing all right. <laughs> uh -huh. There's a bunch of different ways that you could do this, but it's kind of the method that we settled on goes a little bit easier when you're not by yourself there we go sealed off Look at that all right and the last thing I'm gonna do here actually I'm gonna do a second so normally I do two zip ties on the outside but there. normally it's three total we'll get this last one this is just for extra precaution all right so that's not going anywhere two more steps here we're gonna clip off the ends of the zip tie so that we're not worried about these dangly bits There we go. Now I can free my hands and get feeling back to my fingers after putting a death grip on it. Let's trim these a little shorter. Now they still got some pretty pointy ends on them. So the last thing that we do to really secure it and make sure it doesn't scrape on itself and blow a hole is throw some electrical tape on here. If I can get it, I can get it started here. There we go. Get some electrical tape, and we're just basically covering those those zip tie ends with the electrical tape, so those don't poke the balloon under any turbulence or anything else. And make sure there's at least a somewhat smooth spot there there we go I'm wearing my scissors cut that that's free and we got a filled balloon on the safety weight so that shouldn't go anywhere so we're ready with that okay so uh, I'm gonna start up
my microphone cord. Actually, I might have to disconnect because this isn't going to go very far. Let me, uh, I'm going to start up the payload here. Get that going. One second. It plug back in before I get too far here. What are we doing on time? 34 minutes? Oh, perfect. We got time. We got some buffer time. Holy smokes. Okay. All right. So before we get too far, I figure I show you what we got. So we got the. I need my blue gloves. Blue gloves. Remind me to tell you about the blue gloves in case you don't know about the blue gloves. Uh, so this is it. This is our little, little bitty tiny payload. Just this. Here's the, the flight computer, radio transmitter. Uh, some lights, our batteries that are just zip tied to the back, lithium, and that's it. No thermal protection whatsoever. It's flying like this. Whether it works or not, I is yet to be seen. But that's the idea. Make sure we had a good start up here. Yeah. All right. So that chirp, that was the payload there. So. There we go. And then this little tiny parachute that's actually too big for this payload, but that's the smallest one I could find. So hopefully it doesn't drift forever. But one thing on this payload takes forever to get a GPS signal, so I'm going to go hang it in the tree over there so it gets, it's got time to get a GPS signal. So be right back, and then we'll go back to some more questions here because we do have some buffer time here. Okay, wow, my fingers are freezing. <laughs> All right, very, very cold hands. Okay, so blue gloves, in case you didn't see it, blue gloves are keep the oils from your fingers off the balloon. A little bit of controversy from that. Uh, some people say it doesn't really make a big deal. Uh, we just don't want to take any chances. So uh, a lot of things that, uh, that we've read over the years say wear some kind of gloves, protect the oils, uh, protect the balloon. They're very sensitive. Um, you know, to anything. So you usually want to keep them uh, out of the direct sunlight until you're ready to use them. You don't want them filled forever. Wow, this thing is really swinging here. Um, let's just pull this in a little bit here. See if we can protect it from some of the wind. So, so uh, that's what the blue gloves are all about here. Let's see. Uh, Caprina, thumbs up. Good to see you. Yaba City uh, CA. Is that California here? Good luck from Kerry. Thanks very much. Blessings everywhere. Up, up, away uh, from Ken. Ken, this is actually going to land pretty close to your house. It's coming that way. So look up in the sky. Or uh, let's see. What will your data focus on? Mostly, the primary mission here is we're trying to make sure that we can actually figure out where this goes. Radio tracking is the primary issue here. So. That's uh, item number one. Item number two is uh, where we are measuring pretty much the same kind of thing the National Weather Service measures. Temperature, wind speed, humidity, uh, pressure. Bah, there's something else in there, I think. Um, wind speed, position, altitude. There's the one. <laughs> so um, so that's, uh, that's pretty much what we're measuring. And the idea is that this little guy, oh, it's over there now. But this little guy, we could send up just like the Weather Service and capture what the weather service does um, and you know get a skew t graph see how ours compares to theirs throw it up into some interesting patterns see how it swirls around or does something crazy you know in a time where maybe we don't get maybe we don't get it back so uh, you know we still we still want to get it back today but 
in the future we may put them up and say not even going to try to get this back let's just throw it up and see what happens so that's the idea but we want to see if it works first and then we'll expand from there so uh, oh let's see a lot of youtube comments uh, i gotta scroll back here see what i missed um but it's, uh, i hope hope the battery lasts with the cold yeah definitely big concern on the battery super cold temperatures I don't, I don't know if the battery is going to last through the cold. Um, that is definitely, definitely one of the main concerns today is th those very, very cold temperatures. Um, I could come help for recovery. What kind of changes do you... Oh, wait, we already read that one. Most batteries don't last at very cold temps. Hope you're using something to keep it warm. We are not using anything to keep the batteries warm. These lithium batteries do operate... They're specced to operate down to negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is still not far enough because this will likely hit negative 70 something um so we're gonna hope for the best here um da -da -da -da. Uh, let's see use a few hand warmers that hunters use you see yeah a lot of people use hand warmers but they're actually no good those hand warmers actually require air to generate that heat it's a chemical reaction and those hand warmers need air once you get up in the upper atmosphere there's not enough air that you can't get it so we a lot of people use those chemical um, hand warmers that you use they're stick in your pockets but those need air and a lot of people think they work because they you know you put them in your pocket or you hold them beforehand you put them in they're nice and warm comes back down on the ground you pull them out they're still nice and warm like hey look at that it worked but usually in between those hand warmers don't work but a good experiment if you want to run your own balloon flight throw some hand warmers in and monitor the temperature of those hand warmers because those likely drop quite a bit because the the reaction stops, um, they may they may help, um, you know, hold over a little bit of heat, but they do stop working though as it goes up. So, anyways, um, let's see. Glad you use metric unit for your weight measurement. Um, yeah, well, a lot of the tools we use are all metric. I wish I could use metric a little bit more, but uh, I'm just I, I can't do it quite as fast as I can do the imperial stuff. Blame it on the U.S. Uh, education system or something. I don't know. <laughs> but I grew up on imperial measurements, so I, that's what I know by heart. Um, so, uh, uh, Mythbusters did it on their video. Okay. Uh, just, <laughs> Noah, Noah is stuck in the loop. Just send a live cam on the balloon. Noah, I saw your comment earlier. You got <laughs> uh, we don't have any live cams yet. <laughs> uh, let's see. Something, something. Uh, what is it? Um, let's see. No lobsters today. Experimental, yes. Very sketchy. Those batteries might not last at higher altitude. Definitely, the batteries may die. But even if the batteries die, what I'm hoping we have a chance of is they might come back. Maybe. Maybe they die or they drop voltage, but maybe when it comes down and it warms up to a nice toasty 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero Celsius. Eh, see what I did there? Metric. Uh, maybe they come back on. I don't know. We're going to see what happens. Um, let's see. Where did you get the flight controller at? I don't know what you mean by that, Andrew, the flight controller. Not sure what that means, what flight controller. Um, oh, Andrew says, no, the one that Zippo makes. I'm they're talking about a heat uh, hand warmer. I don't know anything about the Zippo one. Is it not a chemical uh, one with air, uh, air reaction hand warmer? I'm not sure. You have to let me know um, if it's uh, something different. All right, so good news. I'm, I'm paying attention here to uh, our payload. We got four satellites locked on for the GPS. I was a little bit concerned that it was going to take forever to lock on to the GPS. Four satellites is a little bit on the low side, though. I, our big flights operate on like 12 satellites. I'd like to see six. That might be pushing it. Five would, I would like, if when we launch, I would like to have at least five satellites. Uh, oh, I'm getting a phone call. Don't need that. Um, so I'd like to have at least five satellites before we launch. Right now we're at four. It's reading 36 degrees out there, 51% humidity, batteries at 4.28 volts, which is right on the money. So, okay, this is where, well, I guess having the procedure in place helps quite a bit because some of the nerves go away because I just follow the checklist procedure here. But, um... So, let's see, I'm just, I'm trying to watch this, uh, my big concern here at the moment is making sure that we continue to transmit and have positioning reports, so we're going to keep an eye on that for a little bit, 
Yeah, so we're still getting new reports, still sitting at four satellites here. So that's, uh, that's, what, we're, that's what we're gonna take a look at here. Um, okay, so, um, so we're looking at, we're about T minus 25 minutes here uh, on the count. Things are progressing so far, so good. Um, let me check, the, let's see, make sure I did everything. Yeah, all that's done. We did that. We did that. We did that. Oh, I'm supposed to take a picture of myself. Hey, that's it. Well, yeah, uh, power, that. Yeah. Uh, yep, that's connected. Yeah, okay, so all that's good. That so far is good. So really, actually, our next step here, our next step doesn't happen for another 10 minutes, and that's notifying Rochester Tracon and Cleveland ARTCC, the two FAA, um, two FAA uh, facilities that requested 15-minute pre-launch notifications. So that's pretty much what we're waiting for here. And I feel like we're missing something, but <laughs> I think I feel that way all the time on these launches. So, but everything went pretty well. This is a little tiny balloon. This is a 200 gram balloon. Our last flight that we did in August was a 1500 gram balloon. So it was almost 10 times as big as this balloon here. Uh, this guy's, I mean, it's big, but it's tiny. This is a tiny balloon here. So. Um, so that's one of the reasons why it's going to um, why it's going to stop at 70, 75,000 feet, or at least that's what I'm expecting, 75,000 feet. Um, this uh, I did probably overfill it a little bit because because this thing's so light, the the filler hose, that green filler. Ho I don't know if you could see it when I was filling it, but the green filler hose actually, I mean, it's got a weight to it, and that I think added to some of the weight while I was filling it. So this may actually be overfilled. Hopefully not too much, but either way, it doesn't really matter. I mean, the, we're, we're testing the tracking method, so even if it breaks at 20,000 feet, not the end of the world. But we're expecting 75,000, so um, let's see. Um, but as you did, how far downrange drift could be? Oh, yeah, so in case you missed it here, that's a good thing we can do here while we got a couple minutes here before the next step. But, uh, I mean, you can go... On a bad day, you can drift 150, 200 miles. Oh, focus. I mean, on a bad day, you can get some serious, serious uh, drifting. But today, we are drifting, and we're, we're looking at only about three and a half miles downrange is our current prediction. So that's what our predicted flight path is. That's plus or minus a couple miles on the actual landing itself. So. You know, we do have a landing zone that we're expecting here. It could be really anywhere in that zone, and every once in a while it lands out of that zone, but not very often. Usually it's within that zone, uh, although we rarely hit the red spot in the zone. Most of the time we hit yellow or sometimes green. We rarely hit the red spot for whatever reason. Um, but uh, that's the zone we're looking at, and it's going to take hopefully this kind of interesting flight pattern. So a couple concerns that we're looking at here uh, all right, we're up to five satellites, so we're good. We're good. We're progressing. I would feel comfortable launching with the five satellites that we're locked on with now. Um, yeah, it take, takes a long time because this thing has a passive GPS antenna, so it get it can read in a lot of noise. It's hard for it to lock on to some of the weaker signals. Our bigger payload has an active antenna and low noise uh, amplifier. What was it called? Low noise amplifier? Is that or noise filter? I don't know what it is, but it filters out all the noise. Filters the noise, amplifies the signals that it needs, um, and so the active GPS that flies on our bigger flights with the cameras usually locks on to about 12 satellites. Um, so, um, but today this passive antenna really does have a hard time locking on the satellites. Five is okay. That gives us enough accuracy that I'm comfortable with. If you get down to like three or four, sometimes the accuracy is you know plus or minus half a mile, and that really makes it hard to recover. So, um, so yeah, I like to see five is like bare minimum. Really, I'm more comfortable with like six plus, but five is kind of bare minimum um, to be ready for launch, and then. Um, uh, what was I, I was going to say something else on that. Oh, this does have the capability to get up to seven, eight, nine satellites, and I've seen this payload get up to seven, eight, nine satellites. It just takes forever. So maybe in the middle of the flight we might get up there. We are also we're a little bit blocked by the building here. 
and some trees and stuff like that. So once it gets above all of that, and maybe some of the noise, it might uh, it might do a little bit better. Yeah, there you go. Low low noise amplifier, Andrew. Yeah, that's a, that's what I was looking for. I knew there. Were, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, let's see. A little bit of debate going on about the Zippo hand warmers. I don't know anything about them, so I can't speak anything. All I know is a lot of people use those oxygen. Um, based hand warmers and those don't work but maybe there's one that doesn't need oxygen as the uh um the catalyst there um so let's see he meant the aprs transmitter oh that the the aprs transmitter that's on our board uh we buy those from uputronics which is a united uh, company in the uk um they all, it's by Radiometrics, but that UK company is the only one that sells them that we can find. So uh, we do have a link. I think it's in the description on our YouTube video um, if, you, if you do want to buy one of those radio transmitters. They really are the easiest to work with for APRS. You can do some much more complicated stuff, but if you're doing APRS tracking, like it's pretty much ready out of the box. works great with, with Arduino, Raspberry Pi. We've got a video about Arduino, too, that uh, makes it pretty easy to, to get set up. Um, so I got about one, yeah, so I'm going to make the phone call here. I think uh, we're at five satellites. I'm, I'm okay with launching it. It's experimental. We'll see what happens. So uh, I'm going to make the call here to our FAA facilities. I got two phone calls to make uh, just for, for privacy. I'm not going to broadcast those phone calls out. But um, I am going to, uh, I'm going to call the FAA, the two FAA facilities here now. I got two like I said, two phone calls, and uh, then I'll be right back with you here. So give me just a minute. All right, so there we go. Launch notification done to the FAA. We call both centers. It's really something simple. You just kind of say, hey, this is who I am. This is what I'm, uh, and we gave them pre-launch notification uh, start as early as uh, Monday. Um, so they're all aware of it. Um, and they were the ones that re they request every, every time we put these up, they request we give them that 15 minute notification. So it's not a complete surprise to them, but we do that 15 minute uh, notification it's really pretty simple um, we do have some notums out there as well for the pilots so that they know what's going on and they know to keep an eye out for this and you know stay out of the immediate area particularly for the launch um, the landing is a little bit harder to stay out of the area but they'll keep an eye on it and this is a very very light payload 100 grams it's like 0 0.22 pounds um, so very very light um, but let's see um, Oh, Andrew says, I don't see the link for the board down below that. Um, uh, well, I, I'm 
Mm, I think there's also one on our website under the how-to section. I think. I'm not sure. But uh, if you shoot us, uh, send us a message on Twitter, then after the flight, uh, I'll, I look through all the messages I get on Twitter. So um, send me a message on Twitter, and uh, I'll, I'll send you a link to it as well. So, um, so there we go. Our notifications are done. And really, at this point, we are set. We're ready to go. We're just at countdown time. So the way this is going to, we're going to hopefully try to get this to work. I usually do this beforehand, but I forgot. But I'm going to, because I'm not going to be able to see. So the, the countdown you see on the screen is the same one that I'm basing, going off of. So I don't have, uh, we're not quite that NASA sophisticated where we got a, uh, there we go. So we're not quite sophisticated enough where we have like some kind of NASA system where I got a master clock somewhere. Computer is the master clock. But uh, I got it on my phone here now because I will have to walk away and try to launch that from out there. And I don't know how far I'm going to be able to get, but we'll see what, um, I don't know. I guess what I'm going to see, there, I got, uh, there's one tree here that's in the way. That's my main concern. I got to get past that tree. I don't think my microphone cord will get past the tree. Well, here, we could test it real quick. We got a, a minute here. But I'm pretty sure, how far, how long is this? Oh yeah, that's not going to work. That is way too short. It is 25 feet, I think, but that's not going to be long enough for me to take the microphone with you. Although I do have, uh, I got this other mic here that we can plug in. So, I don't know, maybe if I yell, you can hear me. But, I mean, all I'm going to be yelling is the old 3, 2, 1, go. So, you're going to see that on the screen anyways. But, um, but that's... Oh, that's what we're looking at here. And then, uh, oh, so I got to change this as well, too. So, getting some wind behind me and making me nervous. Um, all right, let me see. I do, normally I have, um, dee -dee -dee. sorry, I'm adjusting my live broadcast on the fly here because normally, I, like I said earlier, I've got that remote camera that, that will, uh, that I was planning on putting up for the launch. Um, but this is the one I'm gonna use here now. And it should have a map here somewhere. Oh, except here, hold on. Hold on, we're adjusting that this is on the, oh, whoa, wait, we don't need that. Uh, let's see, we gotta, I gotta move myself here behind the map so you can actually see the map. So there we go, that's the idea. That's what we're gonna look at for launch cameras before we get started um, we're not quite ready to uh, to do that yet we still got about 12 minutes so um, so at the moment I'm just gonna keep this up so if you're following along um, let's see how many volts is the payload using and running uh, good question so the payload has two double a batteries on it so that's in uh, they're like one and a half volt battery so ideally it's supposed to, um is that right one uh yeah one and a half volt battery so ideally should be about three volts um yeah am i right yeah i'm pretty sure i'm right on that now now i'm drawing a blank i'm confused on that because so here's what we got here's where my confusion is so um we're measuring much, um, hold on, I'm looking at the map here. So we have on board a step up DC to DC voltage converter to go from that three volt signal up to a five volt signal. And that will, um, that helps power the radio transmitter, which needs five volts. The GPS we use also needs five volts. Um, so those guys are looking at a five, they need five volts, we're only getting three volts in here. So they're actually, the batteries are being uh, drawn on more, it's pulling more amps to get that step up conversion to go from three to five. The three volts is being used for the Arduino Pro Mini. Um, that's going directly to the Arduino Pro Mini for, for servicing that. So that's kind of what's going on. So two AA batteries um, is what we got. So um, let's see. What are we looking at? Six satellites. All right. Yes, I feel much better with six satellites. That feels good. We're looking at 36 degrees, 49% humidity, 4.22 volts 
is what we're currently reading. So it's reading more than three. Um, the, the, our, our readouts are not ex quite exact to the actual voltage themselves. A little bit of tweaking we should probably do to that to get that a little more refined. But it's doing a, a conversion there in, uh, in the Arduino Pro Mini to measure the voltage. Um, so we're at uh, we're reading 4.2 volts right now. Uh, the temperature pressure, there's no conversions on those, so those are pretty good. Um, but the big thing, six satellites, that's fantastic. That's what we're looking for. So, oh, this is the part where it gets a little bit nerve wracking here. We're under 10 minutes. Um, let me see, I haven't checked the Facebook comments here in a minute here. I'm looking at all the YouTube ones, but let me get back to the Facebook and see what you guys are staying there. Um, now is a good time to find something warm, uh, warm to drink. Um, yeah, I, I would love that, but I got we got to get this in the air first. I'm okay. I'm not that cold. It's actually not bad when I'm, I'm even just a few feet away from the the opening there. It's a little bit better uh, temperature wise, so I'm pretty good. Uh, Morris says, "Hey, it's Morris from G Space. Wish you a great, successful flight today." Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Morris. I used to use Trimble working for the Forest Service mapping timber sales and surveys before. That's awesome. Awesome. Good flight. 12 minutes to go. Yep. All right. We're looking good here. If I missed your... Well, I don't know why this doesn't let me scroll anymore. So I might have missed your Facebook comment. If I didn't read your Facebook comment, then I can't see it. So send it again, and I'll take a look at it. Um, but on the YouTube side, let's see. Is this the lobster guy? <laughs> this is the lobster guy. <laughs> yeah. So my... Uh, my SpaceX live broadcast on the Falcon Heavy, where we we decided to give Red Lobster a free uh, free commercial. Um, we are going to fly the Space Lobster. That's coming up sometime in the May time period. So we've got one of our big flights is going to happen probably in uh, about two three weeks, about, well, anywhere from one to three weeks really. That one will have cameras on board. Um, so that's that's coming up in a couple weeks. Um, next time we get a good good window. I mean, part of the issue right now is uh, uh, we've got still got snow on the ground, and that's another reason why I'm inside here is because I don't want to be rolling around in the snow. Um, although I probably will have, you know, at least have to trudge through something to go pick it up once it lands. But uh, hashtag lobster guy. <laughs> somebody start. Somebody starting a new hashtag lobster guy. I don't know if I, I don't know if I want to be referred to as the lobster guy, but all right, sure, why not? I'm a, I'm up for fun here. Let's see. Um, battery. The battery should be enough for the flight. Yeah, capacity-wise, the battery should be good. We've done a lot of testing. These will last for hours. So these batteries, at at this temperature, we're about 30 degrees here. Batteries will last for hours, no problem. Question is going to be when they hit the upper atmosphere and they're down to like negative 70, 80 degrees. How's that going to affect the battery performance? So, so that's uh. That's what we're looking at here, and we're also, uh, so Andrew's mentioned uh, use, uh, about battery packs and things like that. You know, one of the other big concerns is also on weight. Um, because we want to keep this lightweight, we're at 100 grams right now, we want to make sure that, that the weight stays nice and low for the uh, um, for these flights. Because weight is always a big concern on this flight, and on even our bigger flights, weight is always a concern. Heavier weight, we start to run into that the FAA limits. Um, you know, at the four pound, the four pound limit that we try to stay under, it's actually it's technically six pounds, but at four pounds, there's some special restrictions um, that you got to follow. But uh, we try to just stay under four pounds, so we don't have to worry about those. And then you also got to worry about uh, you know parachute size and things like that. So, so anyways, we are. Oh man, I'm talking a mile a minute, but I'm I'm feeling okay at the moment. I was, I was pretty nervous at the beginning, but I'm feeling good at the moment because everything is hooked up and seems to be working okay. Um, you know, the question is going to, I don't know how, I don't know how I'm going to actually launch this thing. So the plan is I probably have to, I'll switch microphones here in just a minute. Um, make sure my watch timer is still synced up. Yeah. So, um, so in just a minute, I'm going to start heading out there. I'm going to release the safety line. We're going to start heading out there. We will uh, so it'll launch. Probably not going to get much. Going to see it much. I'm going to try to get the camera over there, so maybe you can see it. But uh, even if we don't see it, we'll track it online. We'll do some more talking. We'll see. We'll see how we're progressing. It's about a two-hour flight here, so we should. We'll have another live broadcast going on after 
after this broadcast. Uh, so this one will end, and then I'll pick it up on my phone, um, and we'll do another live broadcast um, from the road while we're tracking it down and trying to find it. So, so Andrew, I know all the rules I have. Long. Oh, okay, awesome. He says he leads, uh, he does high altitude balloon launches himself. Fantastic, yeah, definitely. Um, I always like hearing what other people are doing. Um, you know, we're always looking to improve improve our systems here. So, um, Caprina says we're dealing with 10 to 15 mile wind winds. Will it cause the balloon to move faster? Yeah, we're dealing with about the same here as well. Uh, that's why we're undercover here. So once I take it up, um, it is going to uh, um, it, it's going to be affected by those winds. But 10 to 15 miles an hour is really not that bad for a balloon. So. Not a big deal. Um, will the data show up on HabHub? Yes, it should. It's KD2KPZ-11, Kilo Delta 2, Kilo Papa Zulu-11. You can also go to overlookhorizon.com slash map, and that'll take you right to the APRS tracking map. That's what I'll be using to follow along with it. So here we are, T minus four and a half minutes. I'm wrapping this thing up. I'm gonna cut it loose. I'm gonna switch to this other microphone so that I can be free, and you can maybe hear me a little bit, but I'm gonna head out that direction here. Let's switch the cameras, so at least I'm on the full screen. So there we go. We are gonna launch this thing. Let's do it. Here we go. Fingers crossed, wish me luck. Hopefully this goes well. All right, here's the other microphone. I'm just gonna clip it there. I'm gonna try to yell and tell you what I'm doing, but really I'm just gonna cut it free and then we're gonna Try not to hit that tree. So, all right, here we go. And we gotta make sure not to cut the payload line.
Okay, it's up. Boy, that was nerve wracking. I'm gonna plug back in here in a minute. So it's gone. You couldn't re There's no way you're gonna. You can't. Oh, there it is. Gee. Let me plug back in here on the microphone. Holy smokes. Yeah, that was windy. Ah. Yikes. Yeah, that was definitely windy. Uh, I was I was not a fan of that. That had me nervous. I was getting close to trees. I was getting close to houses. Hold on, I got a call coming in. Maybe in case it's the FAA. Okay, I'm sorry to answer phone calls in the middle of the broadcast, but I get a number from Washington, D.C. I thought maybe it could be the FAA. So, holy smokes, that was crazy. Let's get, the, let's get the map up. I don't even know if it's working here. I was trying to get the map up and see. Oh, yeah, we're transmitting 1603. That was, yeah, just, uh, that was just a minute ago. Holy smokes, my heart's pounding like crazy. Let's get the big map up so you can see it. I got to bring my heart rate down because I don't know if you could see that balloon out there once I went back, but that thing was going crazy. I almost hit some trees. I almost hit. I almost hit a car driving by. I almost hit the neighbor's house. Holy smokes! Oh my goodness! Where's the map here? Let me get the map up. There we go. We're up. We're live. Look at it. You see? You see? We're getting. We're getting signal here. So that's right on the APRS website. Uh, if you go to overlookhorizon.com, that's the abbreviation, olhzn.com slash map. You can also just type the whole thing out, overlookhorizon.com slash map. It's flying. Holy smokes. That was nerve-wracking. Can we even see it anymore? I mean, it was, it was gone within... Couldn't even see it within a minute or two. Uh, that thing was out of here, so... I'm not even going to bother moving the camera. I mean, I lost sight of it within just a minute or two. Small balloon. It's a uh, you know, very tiny balloon, and the, if you, you can't really see the sky from the camera. But it's blue skies straight up, but cloud cover to the southwest where the balloon flew to. So flew where the balloon was headed. So as soon as it got to the level of the clouds, like it was impossible to see. And usually you can see like the parachute a little bit, but it's a little tiny parachute. You can't even see that. So... Oh, uh, let's see. Oh, it went off my screen here. What happened? Um, I wonder if I can... Uh, can I refresh that somehow? Turn me. Oh, there we go. Oh, boy. My software almost froze there. I was getting a little nervous. Uh, oh, why won't this... Uh, well, that's a bit annoying. Well, let's see if we can get this tracking map to zoom out a little bit. I don't know why it won't why it won't zoom out but here maybe i can do this and uh let's see will it zoom better yeah okay there we go so a little better here oh my the heart my heart's still going crazy here uh that was really that was really something um yeah we can get rid of the timer we don't need that anymore so now the question really is is this thing gonna work Holy smokes. Oh, man. That was nerve-wracking, trying, uh, trying to get that thing up and running. It's flying fast. It is, yeah, it is going to be move. It's going to be moving quickly. Um, it looks like we're, st oh, we're up to eight satellites. Awesome. Eight satellites. So that's doing pretty well. Humidity is down to 24%. Temperature is down to 26. Voltage is holding steady. So we're looking good. We're at 5,000 feet here. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, and that last notification was 1606. That was just a minute ago. So hopefully it continues to go well. I haven't seen one since 1606, but that was uh, or, you know that was just a minute ago. So we're so far, we're in okay shape. As long as it holds together, like I said, it's experimental, but 
Oh, and that's my, so that was my balloon right there. I can hear, uh, so I'm still hearing chirps locally. Um, you know, the, uh, the weaker one, I don't know if you can still hear that, but the weaker one is the balloon. The stronger one is the, uh, is the car. So, yeah, 1607. So there we go. We're at 6,000 feet. 6,000 feet and climbing. Whew. Yeah, that was, that was something else. That, that got the heart giving the old ba bump ba bump Oh, my goodness. So, so far, so good. It's in the air. Ah, oh, my goodness. I got... So, this, uh, normally, I do this in a pretty secluded place. Big field, wide open. Nobody can see what's going on. But I'm in a little bit of a populated area now. Um, so uh, somebody drove by just as I was going to launch and looked at the balloon. They're like, wow. <laughs> they gave me the old, like, yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit awkward. But anyways, so a lot of people in the, in the area here don't... Uh, don't normally see that sort of thing um but uh but yeah we are we are up and running let me look at the facebook comment i don't know if it's gonna let me look back at the facebook comments though let me try let me see what i can see it used to let me on facebook scroll back through all the comments no problem but for whatever reason now it's it's uh i don't know it's decided that it's not gonna let me scroll through the comments anymore but uh North wind, yeah, the wind's coming out of the northeast currently, heading towards the southwest. It should you turn around uh, in a little bit here. We can take a look at the uh, the prediction here in just a minute and see how well it's following that prediction. Uh, let's see, almost like kite flying, yeah, for sure. That was uh, that was something else. That, that, so I think I'm getting a little bit of a weaker signal here now. So I'm guessing. Guessing that's the balloon that's a little bit on a weak... Yeah, so I just saw it update there. So, yeah, that was likely the balloon there. And that's just for my handheld radio. So the actual chase vehicle there does have um, a much larger antenna. And actually, I'm, I'm a little bit curious if it's... Who's putting it up on the APRS site? If it's me or if it's somebody... Yeah, it looks like it's... Well, it's not me that's putting the... That's re-eye-gating uh, the packets here. I was doing the original ones... But uh, after that, you know, somebody must be beating me to it because all these other packets are being reported by other, other stations here. So, so, so far, so good. Oh, man, I'm still, like, still uh, getting a little bit uh, nervous about it here. Oh, I just got an, an automated email from our email system. That's good to see. Um, yeah, all right. So I, I've got a little automated system. It actually probably threw something out on Twitter, too, uh, that should automatically post updates of the flight, of the position, as it hits certain certain altitudes. Um, so, yeah, look at that. Oh, fantastic. I wasn't sure if that would work. It's really hard to test that without it actually being a flight. But how about that? My little automated tweeter thing actually works. So if you look at our Twitter page here now, you see my automated tweet that came up that said, uh, it's got the uh, picture of the current position and the uh, flight path so far. Whew, okay, so we're off to the races. We're expecting, expecting a two-hour flight today. Um, so that is... Uh, that's what we're, we're we're expecting touchdown around 6 p.m. Eastern time. It U-turned already. I don't see the U-turn quite yet. I do see it. It looks like it's making the turn. Um, I don't think it actually hit the the big U-turn. I'm I'm expecting. Uh, I got another call coming in. Let's see if this is spam like the last one or maybe the FAA. No, that was spam. Somebody wants me to give me a free cruise. <laughs> oh, anyway, so yeah, it's Hab Hub Tracker is working now. Fantastic. Good to see that it's up on Hab Hub. I stumbled on your feed. I have no idea who you are, what this is about, but it looks very interesting. If you have time, could you tell us who you are and what this is about? 
That's a great question if you just got here. Um, I, that's a longer answer, but let me see. Uh, I, <laughs> I want to answer one other question, and I'm going to come back to that, I promise. But somebody said, it's interesting to see the delay between the live map and your live stream. 24 seconds, if anyone was curious. Oh, you actually measured it out. 24 seconds. Yeah, there's definitely a, a delay in the live stream. I don't put that delay on, but by the time my computer downloads the map, software encodes it, sends it back out to YouTube, and YouTube does their YouTube magic, or Facebook, if you're watching on Facebook. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of delay, and that's always the case. But anyway, so in answer to uh, CompuExpert's question, so who are you and what is this all about? So, yeah, so we're not, I'm sure a lot of people are listening, but in case you don't know, we're a nonprofit organization. The idea is we want to get students even adults, into science, technology, uh, get them into STEM careers, get them interested in science and technology. So we do some stuff like this, like launching the weather balloons. A lot of times we get students involved, so we got a couple flights coming up this year that actually have student payloads on them. So if you're interested in actually flying a payload on board one of our flights, we, we want to get students involved so that they can actually fly on our flights with their own payloads. Um, but we like a lot of times we do our own flights like this as well. This one's experimental because this track, this radio tracking system, will likely fly on the student experiment system if it works. So we want to make sure it works. But um, but yeah, so the uh, uh, so we're a nonprofit organization that's really just interested in getting students and adults into science and technology, having a little bit of fun with it, building some cool circuit boards. We help out, you know, in between our flights, we help other organizations uh, with. Tips, tricks, try you know some tutorials. We're trying to put more and more on our website for tutorials on how you can get into this. If you want to fly your own balloon flights, you can also fly with us. We can do coordinated launches where we launch one, you launch one at the same time. We can do, we do there's a lot of stuff we do to try to get into the science and technology. We also do a lot of SpaceX live streams as well because um, it is related to the weather balloon flight. So when SpaceX goes to launch a weather balloon or goes to launch a rocket. Before they do that, really the only the best method that they have for measuring upper level winds is the weather balloon. And that's still, a lot of people look at it and think about it as antiquated technology, but it's still very relevant and one of the most important pieces to our weather forecasting it, today, still. Even with all the satellites we have, weather balloons are still very, very important too. So, um, so yeah, we're, uh, oh, you know what I, so we're, that's what we're all about. And so today is the first flight for... 2018, I'm just getting, uh, I want to get the Hab Hub tracker up there, up on my computer here, because that will automatically calculate the ascent rate for me. I want to see how the ascent rate is comparing to what we're expecting, because um, that will affect our expected flight path as well, to see if that actually uh, does what I'm expecting it to do. So, anyway, so I'm looking at the Hab Hub tracker as well, but um, you can track along with us. Let's see, which way? This way? This way. Overlookhorizon.com slash map. You can actually follow this flight live while it's in the air. If you go to that overlookhorizon.com slash map, click on the balloon icon. Just click right on the balloon, and you'll see the details up above it. It'll show you temperature, pressure, humidity, battery level, all the same stuff I'm looking at. This is how I'm going to find it when it comes back down. Hey, got to, I'm hoping it works the whole way, and that's what I'm going to use to go track this thing down. So we will do another live broadcast later depending on my mobile bandwidth, uh, so that's going to be mobile um, while I'm out chasing this thing down. Depending on my mobile bandwidth, it may be only on one stream, either Facebook or YouTube. So keep an, I'm expecting to do that broadcast right around 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So around 5.30 p.m., if you want to check in on the progress, check out the YouTube channel. If it's not on the YouTube channel, go to facebook.com slash Overlook Horizon, because uh, a lot of times, from a mobile standpoint, the uh, the Facebook broadcast seems to work better when I'm on the road. So likely my next broadcast around 5:30 p.m. Eastern Time will be uh, on Facebook only. So Facebook.com/slash/Overlook Horizon. We'll do another live broadcast Facebook only a little bit later. I'll try to do both Facebook and YouTube, but. If it's anything like all our other flights, I can usually only do one, and the Facebook one seems to be a little more reliable, at least it was in the past. So, um, so let's see, ascent rate, 787 feet per minute. A little bit on the low side. That could be, you can't really look at one measurement. I mean, we want to see a, a couple measurements, but 787 would be on the, a little bit on the low side, which will cause more drifting and will cause a longer flight time if it's rising too slowly. Um, 
But here we go. So the next one that just came in, 839 feet per minute. That's a little closer. I'm expecting about 900, uh, what was it? 985 feet per minute. 900, I think it's nine. No, that doesn't sound right. Maybe it was 945 feet per minute. Um, I don't remember what we calculated ahead of time, but uh, it should be in the 900 range. That's what we're expecting was a 900-ish feet per minute range. The readings right now are coming in a little bit lower than that, but the flight predictions that we ran for um, for the flight, so this is the flight prediction. It was actually kind of cool to see how that transitioned there because it seems to be so far following along with the flight prediction. So far, so good. So we're expecting the big, so it's heading in that south southwest direction. Um, it was expected to make a turn to the northwest, almost a 90 degree turn to the northwest here in uh, just a few minutes. And, oh, there we go, look at that, perfect. 983 feet per minute. I, that was the last reading, 983 feet per minute. That's almost right on the money what we're expecting for the ascent rate. Um, so that's good, and that, that will mean that, that the flight should follow our flight prediction much closer. It's a little bit harder. Um, you know, it's hard to get that ascent rate exact. Uh, you know, we do our best um, with our, our fill measurements. So uh, let's see. Clint, Tom said, I've been in and out teaching a class at the moment, but I wonder if you can address how you're doing the live stream, what applications you're using for split screen. So, yeah, we use a software application called Wirecast. I like it. Um, we've used it for uh, this is our second year using Wirecast. Um, got a I've got some monitors on stands here behind me, and just a laptop. It's a pretty high powered laptop in order to be able to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, Wirecast is really what's facilitating all the live broadcast stuff. It's pretty similar to the OBS software, Open Broadcast software. Um, but uh, wire, I, for whatever reason, I liked Wirecast better, so that's what we went with, and what we stick with is the Wirecast. That lets us do some of these, uh, some of the cool transitions. We've got a whole bunch of shots set up so I can share things like our flight prediction map, and then uh, the actual map itself for where the flight is, and then also this is our heat map of where we're expecting landing here. So, um, so this is, uh, yeah, that's what we're using for for live broadcasting, and then later. The the one I do later, when we actually go get this thing and track this thing down, that's just going to be on my phone. Um, there's nothing special there. Um, I've tried to do, in the past, I have tried to use Wirecast on the road to do this uh, fancy broadcast for, uh, for the recovery efforts, but it just never ends up working. The mobile bandwidth, I try to run it off my cell, you know, I got to run the... the broadcast off my cell phone and you're moving and it's that's a uh, that can be very difficult so um so yeah the, the one later on will be with my phone facebook only facebook.com slash overlook horizon check it out um so you can follow along with us because we'll do it no later than 5 30 really um it actually probably be before that because we're expecting burst the balloon burst should be about 5 15 and usually I try to start the broadcast before the balloon burst so we can see the max altitude. So it might actually be closer to like 10 after 5 Eastern time. I do got to get something to eat here at some point in this because I'm hungry and yeah, still high stress from getting that balloon up in the air. When, it's, when the wind is blowing as hard as it is today, we're at like 15 mile per hour winds right now. So I'm undercover, which made it really nice to fill the balloon. But I didn't, if you saw it on the video, as soon as I stepped out from there, that thing was going nuts and... Uh, we almost uh, we almost killed the flight before we even launched it. So uh, almost time for the turn to begin. Yeah, we should see. Um, hopefully, I haven't really been checking in on it, but uh, hopefully it's still transmitting and we're still going strong. I don't know. Let's see. Pull it back. Oh, where is it? I don't have it. Oh, is it this one? I've got so many things open on my phone. Uh, loading. 1621. Yep, so new signal just received a minute ago. 1621. We're already at 
18,000 feet. Somebody have to convert that to meters for me, but 18,000 feet, 18,500 is where we're at. Nine satellites on the GPS, that's fantastic. That's more of what we want. Nine satellites gives us very accurate positioning. Uh, we don't see, it's really difficult for me to get that when it's on the ground, but nine satellites that it's locked onto, that's fantastic. Um, we're at negative four degrees Fahrenheit. Pressure's at 485 millibars. Humidity's at 46%, and the battery is down to 4.04 volts. Still in good shape on the battery. When it gets down to like, if it gets, it'll hover in the high three volt range for a while. Um, so it's not unusual to see it drop. You know, 4.04 volts is okay. If it gets down to 3.5 volts, now we're it's time to time to worry. If you start seeing readings that are like 3.3 volts, now it's really time to worry. Because once you get, so the issue when it drops that low, uh, I need to charge my phone here. The issue when the battery starts to drop that low is not so much the Arduino, because the Arduino can handle 3.3 um, volts. That's what the Arduino needs. But uh, when the, so we need to do a step up conversion to go from the three volt batteries to a five volt signal for the GPS and for the radio transmitter. Primarily it's that radio transmitter, super power hungry. And if it doesn't get all five volts and it's underpowered, it's gonna, it, it will, it will try to draw that power and it ends up sucking out too much power and the Arduino ends up resetting. So we start to see some power cycle issues when the radio transmitter goes to broadcast. If it doesn't have enough voltage, it will reset the board because the power that basically browns out and you know doesn't have enough power to continue to run the, the Arduino. So, um, what does the nine satellites mean? Sorry if you explained it earlier. So the nine satellites that I'm celebrating about is the GPS signal. So it's basically the strength of the GPS signal. It's the number of GPS satellites that the payload is locked onto in order to calculate its position. So generally, you need at least three satellites to triangulate your position with the GPS satellites. Um, a lot of times, three satellites is not enough to get pinpoint accuracy. Four, you even still struggle with it. You get into five, okay, now you're getting pretty accurate signals. Six is where I start to feel comfortable. Anything more than six, and it's fantastic. Seven, eight, nine satellites. Now it's basically locked on to nine satellites to figure out and compute what its position and altitude is. And at nine satellites, you get a very accurate picture on position. Even six is not that is, is still accurate enough for us to track it down. If you get below that, like you know, five, four, three satellites, then. Um, you start to see wild accuracy uh, or inaccuracies with the position, uh, which and altitude too. But position is really what I'm concerned about because if you only have like three or four satellites, it could it'll pinpoint a spot on the map and say, "Oh yeah, I'm right here," but really it's half a mile away from there because it just didn't get it position accurately enough. Um, so oh, let's see, another call coming in. Am I getting spam calls all day today, or is this a real one here? Okay, well, just kidding. They hung up on me. So my concern is we've had a lot of contact with the FAA the last uh, the last couple days. Um, they're having us do a new procedure, and uh, so we've gone back and forth with them quite a bit. Oh, here they are calling again here. Let me see if this is for real. No, that's not a call I need to take. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as I answered it, I heard. So anyways, had a lot of contact with the FAA. They had us doing this new procedure, which wasn't really that much, but they wanted us to, normally we notify Rochester Track on 15 minutes prior to launch time. Um, but in addition to that, they had us notify in Cleveland Center. And so they were trying to get us the proper people at Cleveland Center that, that would want those notifications. They, they told us that Cleveland Center wanted them, but they weren't sure who they wanted us to actually tell. So uh, so we had a lot of back and forth with the FAA the last couple days just to solidify that. It has been a couple months since our last flight, so everybody's a little bit, uh, um, not necessarily out of practice, but just uh, not used to having these balloon flights that are in the, the Rochester, New York area. Um, so, 
so yeah, I'm just w watching my phone for some of those strange numbers. Um, see if it was the FAA contacting me just in case they needed something. Although at this point, not really anything I can do. Now that the balloon's in the air. So, but they may want to know where it is. Um, although they are getting, uh, they they are monitoring um, our APRS signals and watching those so they can track the balloon. So, um, so let's see, Willie, I'm back. What did I miss? Well, so far, so good. Um, everything's progressing normally. The payload is operating as it should. We just got a signal, uh, 1626, so just one minute ago. Negative 13 degrees Fahrenheit. Pre oh, you know what? Huh, totally forgot that I had this. But uh, here, look at this. I did all, spent all this time putting this together. Here, look at this. You can actually see. So I'll take a second maybe I don't know if this will work it says 859 feet don't believe that it's not 859 let's see if this updates I don't know if it will um, this was this is another experiment some of the stuff that I did in the off season trying to generate trying to make this cool dashboard where it would show you a little bigger what the actual altitude was although now that I think about it I think it's looking at the wrong call sign I don't think it's looking at the right call sign um yeah, well, so that's a fail. Okay, well, I guess we won't look at that. <laughs> gotta remember, that's one thing I forgot to do before launch time is update that uh, update that dashboard so it looks at the right call sign. I'll have to remember to do that for the next time. Because it's a cool little dashboard. It shows you a little bigger altitude. has some of the, the readouts on it. You can see them on here, but these are a little bit tiny. And I can't really zoom in because even if I zoom in, they still show up tiny. Um, so anyways, that's what we are, that's where we're at right now. It looks like I'm seeing a little bit of stutter in the pattern here, so maybe we're getting ready for that turn to the, uh, to the northwest. If I zoom in, I'm getting a little bit of a, a little bit of a button hook pattern there at the end, and you can kind of see it on the map here, so I think it's getting ready to make a turn to the northwest here to follow our flight prediction. Which would be pretty awesome. Hab Hub updates better. Uh, yeah, I use Hab. I do have the Hab Hub thing here, but uh, for some reason, it uh, it doesn't look good on the broadcast. See, I can pull up Hab Hub here. I do have a shot for that, but yeah, so yeah, it's not even on here. So yeah, I can't use that on the broadcast for whatever reason. So. We're going to stick with the, just the regular APRS website here. And yeah, it looks like it's making that turn making that turn to the northwest here. So we're expecting a northwest turn. It's going to make a big U-turn here. It's going to northwest for a few minutes, uh, and then it will make another 90-degree turn and head to back to the northeast and go almost right back the way that it came. Um, <clears throat> so we are. Uh, that's what we're expecting right now. And, uh, all right, let's see. Have you considered slow scan TV? I've, yeah, we've thought about doing um, SSTV stuff. Really haven't gotten into it, but um, but yeah, we did. We have plans to do all kinds of uh, new and exciting stuff with our electronics. But uh, for whatever reason, we, we've had some issues with some of our electronics in the past, and I suspect that a lot of them. Well, I know that a lot of them are centered around the cameras that we use that are very noisy in terms of electromagnetic interference. They cause a lot of issues that were really hard to troubleshoot. Um, so those cameras that we use on our big flights were causing a lot of issues. So one of the things we wanted to sort out for some of those big flights, I think something's wrong with your mic. Oh, is it? Where is it? Where is my mic? Where'd my microphone go? Ha! Well, my microphone fell off my lapel. Wonder how long, Wonder how long that's been going on. <laughs> How's that? Better? Your audio is messed up, bro. Yeah. Sorry. 
my, my microphone apparently fell off my lapel, went down my shirt. So you're probably hearing a lot of, probably hearing a lot of shirt noise as it shuffles around in there. Much better. Yeah. All right. I'm sure that is. It's probably pretty annoying if it was in my shirt there. wonder how long that's been going on. Hopefully not forever. Um, so let's see. Yeah. Definitely tell me when stuff like that goes wrong. <laughs> he dropped the mic. Yes. Dropped the mic. Um, there we go. All right. Yeah. Look at that. Made the turn to the northwest. Now we are heading northwest, hitting another layer of the atmosphere here. So that's one of the cool things that I love about doing these flights. Um, is, uh, you know, a lot of people, you see a wind prediction or you're sitting here on the ground and you're, you know, you feel the wind. You're like, well, I know the wind is going from the northeast and it's going to the southwest. So it must be going to the southwest from here until wherever the wind stops. But you get these layers in the atmosphere where you have, you got this, this wind out of the northeast here. And then all of a sudden we got a, you know, at, uh, what, I can't read what altitude we are. Is it 27,000 feet? Is that what that says? Um, let me look on my phone where I can read a little better. Yeah, 27,000 feet. And uh, all of a sudden the wind is out of the, the, the southeast and heading to the northwest. So, yeah, it can get, it's kind of crazy how, uh, how that can change like that. And then in another couple thousand feet, it's going to come out of the southeast and head back to the northeast or southwest and head to the northeast. And, and so I, I love doing flights that are, that have these interesting wind patterns because they're, I mean, it's so unusual and it just, uh, it's a topic of discussion. I mean, people look at it and they're like, wow, what? How does that happen? You know, a lot of people that you just see a weather forecast, you're like, oh, well, the wind's coming out of the northeast, so that's what the wind's doing. But it, that's just ground level winds. So, and that's a lot of what like SpaceX is measuring when they're sending up weather balloons before rocket launches. And even what the National Weather Service is doing, they're measuring not only those surface level winds, but those upper level winds. They're looking for sinking air masses that, that are causing like these big convections. Um, so, there's a there's a lot of a, you know a lot of use in measuring those upper level winds you know just as much as the ground level winds if not more than the upper level winds so um bw timer do you use the national weather service buffalo sounding to predict the path uh, not directly but it does but indirectly yes um so the software that we use for flight predictions uses the, the GFS, the Global Forecast System, um, which the Buffalo soundings are contrib contribute to that forecast model. So, but the, it's not specifically the Buffalo sounding that we're looking at, although most of the data that that it's based off of is coming directly from those Buffalo soundings that uh, that happened earlier today. Um, so, you know, the, it's actually a little bit trickier doing launches you know right about now because um because the last sounding flight was at six o'clock in the morning and there's going to be another one here at six o'clock at night so there will be another one soon but um but yeah there hasn't been an actual sounding uh, you know radio sound flight locally in buffalo since six o'clock this morning so um so you know, when you get that far away from the last radio sound it is a little bit trickier um, but they do put out updated forecasts every six hours. So we're operating, our flight predictions are operating off the, the noontime forecast that came out about four and a half hours ago. So, all right, now, now, is, now we're getting into the tricky stuff here. All right, so I don't, if you can read that temperature there, this is, the, this is the part of the flight that's very concerning. So the temperature system is reading negative 43 degrees Fahrenheit. These, I'm pretty sure it's Fahrenheit. I don't know if it's Fahrenheit or Celsius. Somebody look up the specs on the Energizer lithium batteries. I guess I could do that. But the Energizer lithium batteries are rated to negative 40 degrees. And I think it's Fahrenheit. Energizer lithium temperature. Give me an answer, Mr. Google. Um, oh, maybe it's negative 40 degrees. Well, actually, it doesn't even matter because uh, isn't negative 40 Celsius and negative 40 Fahrenheit the same thing? Isn't that right? Um, that's where the two, uh, two scales meet, right? 
is it negative 40 degrees I'm pretty sure that's right um, so yeah I guess it doesn't I guess my answer doesn't even I don't even have to go look at it so um, but anyway so these are rated down to negative 40 degrees um, yeah, so that's what somebody said. Aren't negative 40 Fahrenheit and negative 40 Celsius the same thing? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the temperature now is below the operating specifications for our batteries. And there is no thermal protection on these batteries. And so we're getting into danger territory right now. This is one of the main concerns that I have for this flight is just the temperature on it, will these batteries survive to provide enough power. We're still reading 3.98 volts. We're at negative 53 degrees Fahrenheit right now. 22% humidity, 269 millibars for pressure. Uh, we're looking at 31,500 feet. Somebody have to come up with a metric version of that for me, but. 31,000 feet, and we are in danger temperature territory, which was to be expected, not unusual, completely expected, but the uh, the unexpected part is really just, will it survive? Is it going to, is it going to make it through those frigid temperatures? And even if it does not make it through the frigid temperatures, if it comes out of the frigid temperatures and warms up to a toasty 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which is where we are right now, they uh, then, you know, if it's, it, it will the batteries come back on? Sorry, we've got multiple trains of thought going on. But if the batteries die, let's say, hypothetically, maybe, maybe the batteries will come back after they warm up. Certainly possible. Um, cause they could die, drop in voltage, warm back up, maybe get a more, a little more battery capacity, you know, a little more oomph to them and maybe they light back up. So, so even if we see the signal die, doesn't necessarily spell the end of the flight. We could survive it, but I'm hoping it just survives right through it. That would be fantastic. But, uh, so Andrew says, are these double A batteries? Yes, these are double A, but they're not alkaline batteries. They are double A ultimate lithium batteries which are rated to super low extreme temperatures although those like i said those super low temperatures is still that's negative uh 40 degrees not the current uh temperature that we're seeing which is the uh let's see what are we at now currently reading negative 55 degrees so we are 15 degrees lower than the minimum operating temperature of these batteries here so we're hoping for Open for something good here. Because, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I just don't know. I don't know if it's going to survive. So, um, so there we go. Another, got another automated report here. Also got automated report posted up on the Twitter machine. Um, sorry for the people watching on Facebook. I kind of neglected the comments a little bit. Pretty impressed you had up to eight satellites on the GPS. Yeah, that's pretty... Uh, that's what we, well, eight satellites is pretty normal. That's what we want to have. Usually they, um, um, usually the, uh, the larger one has around 11, 12 satellites. Um, your phones these days, like you get like a nice Samsung or a nice iPhone, um, you know, probably the Google phone too. And I, I don't yell at me about what brand you like, but you know, whatever, if you get one of these really nice phones, a lot of those can reach like 20 something satellites on the GPS. They can lock onto a lot so uh will will you retrieve this before dark pack food and hot beverages yeah i do have to get some food i am getting hungry um and uh uh but yes we should recover it well we should land before dark let me let me clarify we will land before dark we may not recover it before dark it really depends on where it where it lands if it lands in the middle of a field happy day we're going to grab it pick it up Thank you very much. If it lands in a, if it uh, lands in a tree, that makes it a little more difficult. So, we'll see. Um, so Andrew said lithium ion. No, they're not lithium ion. They are lithium uh, lithium iron. Is what the lithium ultimate batteries are. Something like that. Um, but they're not lithium ion batteries. Lithium ion batteries 
are only rated to, I think, zero degrees. And I think that's Celsius. I don't know. Um, Tempest Drive, I saw that already. They do soundings at 00 Zulu and 12 Zulu, right? That would be 8 a.m. 8 and 8 p.m. Um, the forecast comes out at 00 Zulu and 1200 Zulu. The soundings actually happen before the forecast. So the sounding goes up. They launch the, the balloon flight two hours. Um, yeah, is it two hours before? Two hour, or maybe it's one hour before the sounding. Uh, or yeah, it's either one or two hours before the actual forecast comes out is when they launch the balloon. They have to give it time to go up in the air and measure, you know, take some measurements. And then they have an automated reporting system. If you watch our National Weather Service video that we did when we actually launched with them, um, they it automatically through their computer system reports directly into the, the forecast model. So, but those sounding flights launch before the forecast comes out. Um, so it's either an hour or two hours. I, with the daylight savings time, I get confused on whether it's, but it's either, it's 6 a.m. and 7 a.m., depending on whether it's daylight savings or not. And I don't remember which, I, I'd have to do math on the fly, and I'm a little bit sleep deprived and hungry and stressed from launching a weather balloon, so I can't do that math that fast. But, um, but yeah, it's either 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., and then 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. that they launch, um, and they do that ahead of the, the forecasts that come out. So, um, let's see. Uh, oh, okay, I got more. I missed some comments. Um, um, Buckeye Storm says, what's running your telemetry? I missed the early part. I assume you have a separate Arduino system of some sort you're running off the batteries you're concerned about. Um, well, it's not really separate. Um, everything's all just one piece. So the onboard payload is one circuit board that has an Arduino on it and um, all the weather sensors, temperature, humidity, pressure, uh, and then the GPS, which has the altitude this and calculates the wind speed and things like that. Um, did I miss anything? And then the batteries with the battery level. Um, so that's all one system, and those two lithium batteries are running that whole thing. So if they die, everything dies. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, there's no uh, there's no separate system per se. I mean, it is you know the Arduino is powering the you know the Arduino is the logic behind everything. You know the sensors need the Arduino to control it and pull for data. The Radio transmitter needs the Arduino to tell it what to transmit. Um, the uh, the GPS needs the Arduino to ask for GPS positions, all that kind of stuff. So really, the G the Arduino is the hub, but it's all happening on uh, on the same batteries there. So so yeah, if the batteries die, then everything dies. Uh, and I'm hoping that doesn't happen. It looks like though that we may be hitting the tropopause. So the tropopause. Because now we are we are up to a toasty negative 45 degrees. So the tropopause happens. Uh, that's the separ the separation layer between the troposphere, the lower atmosphere layers, and the stratosphere, the upper atmosphere layers. Usually that sits between 30,000 and 60,000 feet. And the tropopause when you hit the tropopause, the um, the temperature. So when you go up in the atmosphere in the troposphere, the temperature always decreases. On, or not always, but for the most part, as a trend, it decreases. You can have little temperature inversions where it increases in little spots and things like that. Um, we can get into that topic more if we want. But as a trend, the temperature decreases the higher you go in this troposphere. But once you pass that, then the temperature starts to increase in the stratosphere. So it will invert. And it looks like maybe we are seeing that um, because we are... We are increasing in temperature now, and we are up to uh, we are up to negative 44 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a great sign because that that means we didn't stay in that negative 50, negative 60 degree territory for very long. So we may have a shot with these batteries, um, and it's still early on. The batteries still have a lot of strength with them. 3.81 volts we're reading, still fantastic, still looking good. It should sit around that level. 
for quite a while and we only got about hour and 15 minutes left until landing so we're still looking good on battery level oh my goodness if the battery dies eek no telemetry yeah that's exactly it if the battery dies everything dies no we don't know where it, where it's flying we don't know obviously don't know the weather conditions but that's the least of our worries the biggest thing is positioning and radio transmissions we need those batteries so so we know where the thing is um, but so far so good we're hoping it holds out um, so the next time you use naked batteries and you use this brand we don't have to worry about oh, I'm assuming there's a message about that somewhere I'm going to get some so I can do a test and give you data when I make my addition to the battery. Oh, okay, yeah, definitely. Let us know if you come up with something uh, something interesting. Um, I think it's the Energizer L91AA Ultimate Lithium Battery. Yes, Gregorius. I believe I, I L91 sounds right. I don't know that. I don't have that memorized, but that does sound right. It is the Ultimate Lithium Battery by Energizer. They're two double A's, and that's what we're using on board this flight with no thermal protection. A little bit risky, but zero thermal protection. It's just a bare circuit board. Those batteries are just sitting out in the cold. There is nothing protecting them. So, um, let's see. For some reason, the map on my browser recognizes metric units, yet the temperature is still in Fahrenheit. Um, yeah, so that's an APRS setting. If you're looking at the APRS map, if you go up to the top, let's see, which, this way. You go up to the, I think it's the top right-hand corner of the browser, you can change your settings into Imperial, if you want Imperial. Our temperature, so our payload determines what format to send the temperature in. We're sending the temperature in Fahrenheit. That's what I recognize. That's what I can operate off of. So sorry if, for the, those metric people, but... But yes, that makes sense that the payload will report Fahrenheit temperature. No matter what your APRS settings are, the, the Arduino is only sending the Fahrenheit number. Um, so there's no calculation done on that. But if you want to see like the altitude in Imperial settings in feet, um, you got to change the APRS settings up in the top right corner of the browser to show you Imperial settings because by default the APRS will show you metric settings. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people are going to say, keep it on metric, metric's better. And I, it probably is better. I mean, I just don't, I just didn't grow up with that. So it's just not familiar to me. So, um, so there, there's that. Um, I found where I can get some, yeah, the, the ultimate lithium batteries, this is a pretty common AA battery. You should be able to just grab them on Amazon. Uh, that's where we get them. So, um, some liquid nitrogen to test with it. Yeah, now we're talking. Now we're getting into experimentation. Um, let's see. What are we looking at here? For... Da, 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 da. Oh, hey, I got a donation from Vladimir. Thanks, Vlad. I appreciate that. Yeah, so uh, in case you're really feeling generous, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. If you like this kind of stuff and you want to see us do more... Um, Head over to overlookhorizon.com slash donate or uh, look us up on the PayPal Giving Fund um, as Overlook Horizon. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, so any donations we take in, they go towards our flights or towards getting students on along with our flights so that we do have some student flights planned for a little bit later this year. Um, so we're definitely going to do plenty of that as well, and it helps us get students into science and technology, and they can see stuff like this and you know, see, get some interest in it. Hopefully they, you know, find something fun with science and tech and that they can pursue that as a career. Uh, so let's see, uh, Gregorius, no worries, dude. I was just pulling your leg with the metric unit thing. Oh, yeah. Well, you're not, you're not the only one. I get a lot of people that, uh, you know, I, we probably get, I don't know, a dozen comments a week from people that yell at us for not having metric units on our, when we put out our videos with the, the, the flights that have cameras on board. We get a lot of people that yell because we put the altitude in feet and the temperature in Fahrenheit and stuff like that. It's, that's what we know, so that's what we do. Um, hey, the balloon is coming back to where you launched it. Yeah, actually, the interest. So I do see it, it made that turn to the northeast. And actually, my radio here is starting to pick up the faint signals again. So it lost it when it got, all, when it got down to the... I guess it's this way on the screen. Lost it when it got down to that, that peak down at the the southwest there but now that it started to turn and it's coming back 
Uh, I'm picking it up on the radio again, right here next to me. And my, I got my big antenna over there um, that's also um, picking it up as well. Um, but this one here is just smaller, uh, smaller radio here. Uh, let's see. Oh, you launch students too? No, 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 no. No, we don't launch students. Uh, uh, yeah, we probably wouldn't get permission for that. No, we. <laughs> No, we launch student experiments. Uh, we, the students aren't the experiments. The students provide the experiments. Yeah, usually, a lot of times, they'll, they want to fly cameras on board or look at uh, gathering temperature data or uh, even the humidity data. Or some do even some other experiments like putting on marshmallows or um, putting liquids on board. Or they just want to fly a school mascot up and get the, the picture, the video of it up near in the, you know, the near space environment. Um, so yeah, no hashtag space students. Uh, that would not be a good idea. But yeah, I know I know you're joking, Leia. I appreciate. It. <laughs> I like it because um, I. And also, it kind of goes similar. A couple weeks back, I posted on Twitter and I said something about um, it was during the ULA launch. And uh, when I posted on Twitter, I said uh, you know you know watch our live video or something as we launch Tony Bruno. It was supposed to be Tony Bruno's like apostrophe s. I forgot the apostrophe s, so it said. Watch, watch our live video as we watch and comment uh, while ULA launches Tony Bruno. <laughs> Tony Bruno is the CEO of ULA, the United Launch Alliance. So uh, I apparently have a habit of saying stuff like that. We're launching Tony Bruno. We're also launching students, apparently. I don't know. We're not launching students. But, um, but yeah, anyways. So, yeah, looking. Uh, let's get another... Uh, Let's get another. Um, -bum. Let's get an update on where we stand here. Oh, we're rising. We're at a a sweltering negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're coming up. Good sign for the batteries because now we are above the minimum operating temperature for these batteries. So that is a good sign. Um, we're not completely out of the water on that. I'll tell you about that in just a minute. But we're up to 45,000 feet. Um, negative 34 degrees Fahrenheit, 142 millibars, 10% humidity, batteries at 3.98 volts. So, um, so I said we're not completely out of the water yet. The other big thing that we need to worry about is when the balloon breaks and it comes down, that is a, that's going to be a concern because, well, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I'm not, not sure how concerning that's going to be. So on our bigger flights, the styrofoam cooler provides some insulation and keeps the heat inside. When the balloon breaks and we drop, air gets forced into that styrofoam cooler and it cools the inside like super fast. Um, so that um, that's always a concern on our bigger flights is when it breaks, that temperature just plummets as it drops through the atmosphere. But I don't, I don't even know, now that I think about it, that may not be a huge concern for us because we're already... We're already flying completely exposed, so there's no uh, there's no heat really being contained, and it actually probably be on. I'm thinking that it will be better because um, because there's it's just going to fall right through that the super cold area. So hopefully it'll go through in a hurry um, with any luck. That's the idea. That's what I'm thinking. So. Willie, could you charge to launch people's name, given that you're a nonprofit? Yeah, we've thought about doing stuff like that. Um, I want to come up. I think it'd be really cool to come up with a system where you could send us a picture of yourself or something, and you know, you donate five bucks or so or whatever it is. And if we had a you know a camera, dark blackness of space, and like a LED or LCD screen that. Uh, you know, maybe rotated through some pictures. We could actually get you know a couple fifteen second video or something of your your picture with the space background above Earth. I thought that'd be pretty cool. I don't have a system for that yet, but that's in my my ideas book um, for uh, wait because it is tough. It's tough to uh, you know not that we're trying to generate income, but you know everything we do has a cost to it. So we want to make sure we can continue to do flights. And uh, so we rely on those donations. We get we have some corporate donations as well. Um, so we rely on those donations to fund all our flights and all our our 
our extra stuff that we do too with, with some of the Maker Fair appearances or some, some of the support that we provide to remote students that are launching their own flights or we also want to get into like some robotic stuff. We've built our own little mini robotics, ro robots uh, on the Android platform and so we want to get students in to be able to do that as well because it's a super cheap platform or inexpensive platform, I like that word better. It's an inexpensive platform to get yourself into robotics. You know, for uh, 30, 40, 50 bucks, you can get yourself a, you can build yourself a robot. It's pretty awesome. Um, my, my son loves it. My son's four years old. He chases the, and me and my daughter was two. They chase the robot around uh, that, that we made. They love it. So, so anyway, so far, so good. It's actually coming pretty close back to, uh, Heading over Bloomfield now, if my sister's watching, look up in the sky about uh, 47,000 feet up. It's flying right over your house now. Uh -huh. So uh, yeah, there's no way you're going to be able to see it. I lost it. I lost it in the sky after it was about 1,000 feet up. So no way you're going to see it. What did, what did I say? 50,000 feet? 47,000 feet up? So all right, let's see. I want to, you know, normally I do the, the burst broadcast from the road. I'm trying to figure out how, how I want to do this here. Let me, I got a uh, let's see. Buckeye, it would be no different from a charity posting names of contributors and donors in their facility and in their marketing. Yeah, I, I mean, I would think so. I mean, you can, the only, uh, no, we're not coming down yet. Uh, we're still, we're still ascending. Um, yeah, the only thing, uh, like when it comes to donations from a nonprofit is like if you're going to take a tax write off on it my understanding and I'm not an accountant there's my disclaimer you got to talk to your accountant about it but my understanding is that if you're going to make a donation to our nonprofit we can't give you some we can give you something in return but then you can't claim it as a tax write off um, so my understanding is if you want to claim the tax write off as an actual donation then you have to donate it and not get anything in return um, so, or you can claim the tax write-off. Like, if you get, if you donate ten bucks and you get something of the, in return that was two dollars of value, you can only claim eight dollars as a donation, you know, the tax deductible donation. I don't know. That's my understanding. You got to talk to an accountant. We got, yeah, that's that's how it's been explained to me. I don't know if I'm right, but check that out. So, anyways, um, so yeah, we could fly names up there. You just may not be able to claim it as a tax deductible donation, but. Like I said, your accountant would be able to figure that out for sure. So, um, there's my bit on donations to our 501c3 charity. All right, heading down North Bloomfield Road. That's pretty close to it. That's like, as the crow flies, that's like a mile and a half away from us, which is crazy. Um... So that, yeah, we're, we're doing okay. Negative 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, I'm hearing noise out there. Negative 32 degrees Fahrenheit, 115 millibars. Humidity's at 8%. Battery is back up to 4 volts. Looking fantastic. 4 volts on the batteries. So that's, uh, so that's what we're looking at here. We're, we're in good shape so far. I'm feeling much better about this flight. So far, I'm trying not to jinx myself here, but at the moment, I'm feeling pretty good. So, let's see. What do we want to do here? I, I got to get something to eat. It's a homing shrimp. It's coming home. Yeah, right? That'd be, that'd be awesome. So, the closest downrange recovery record that I've ever heard of is two miles from the launch site. Um, I'm sure there's probably others out there, but on the AR Hab website, there's a record for two miles as the closest downrange recovery. Our personal record is... 5.01 miles, and this is as the crow flies, direct from launch site to landing site. Our record is 5.01 miles as the shortest downrange landing distance. We do have potential to break that today and have an even shorter downrange landing distance, but it's all going to depend on that burst and on that parachute because we don't know if that parachute is going to cause extended drifting. So, um, so just to remind you, so this you're looking at that's the flight path that that's the actual flight path that we're looking at this is the predicted flight path this is what we're expecting to see so far it's following that track pretty close to uh to what we're expecting to see um 
so I mean everything's looking looking like it's going very well and according to plan the big question now is just going to be when will that balloon burst happen and is the parachute what's the parachute going to do is it going to cause it to drift too much or is it going to be okay so let's see andrew i'm feeling better about the battery you and me both i am feeling better about the battery as well um yeah much better now that the temperature is coming back up negative 31 degrees um, definitely feeling much much better about the battery now with that temperature um being back uh you know coming up so are you running on 144.39 or alternative frequency yeah no this is aprs on 144.390 megahertz so yep this is right on uh, the regular u.s aprs frequency 144.390 call sign is kilo delta 2 kilo papa zulu and then there's a dash 11 after it but um my name is going to the sun along with hashtag space lobster oh yeah if you don't don't know what carrie's talking about um there's uh nasa's got a little website where you can go put your name in and they like they're going to print it out put it on a card and put it on their uh the um the, what's the sun probe the nasa sun probe that's launching um so yeah you can get your name sent to the sun for real so that's kind of cool we did it and i made one for hashtag space lobster too uh, have you got a ham license to run on that frequency? Yes. Uh, you do have to have an amateur radio license or ham radio license in order to broadcast on that frequency. I do have one. That call sign KD2KPZ, Kilo Delta 2, Kilo Papa Zulu. That's my FCC issued call sign for, uh, for my amateur radio license. So, um, so yes, you do have to have a license to run on that frequency. It's not that hard to get, and I actually recommend it because uh, you know a lot of people think about the ham radio stuff or the amateur radio stuff, and they think about the oh Parker probe. That's that's the one. Sorry, somebody just said the Parker probe. That's the Sun probe that I was talking about. Thank you, Leah. I forgot what that was called. Um, yeah, if you want to send your name to the Sun, look up the Parker probe, and uh, you can send your name to the Sun. Um, so what was I saying? Oh, the amateur radio license. A lot of people think about it like kind of old school or antiquated. Uh, you know, just talking on the radio, which that, I mean, that kind of stuff can be fun too. And I'm definitely not knocking that. That's certainly, um, you're certainly, uh, a fun hobby, but for a lot of people in today's day, some people look at the amateur radio or the ham radio stuff and they're like, oh, I got a cell phone now. What do I need a ham radio for? And it's, it's really not even, it's not just the voice communications that you can do with an amateur radio license. Stuff like this, we got no voice transmissions happening right now. This is all data. And so we got radio frequencies happening all around us. Your cell phone's a radio frequency, your Wi Fi, your Bluetooth, they're all radio frequencies that are, and you can develop computer systems with Arduino. You don't have to use APRS. You can do remote control for, um, stuff with amateur radio. You could do, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can do with it beyond the voice communication so um so it's super it's not that hard to get your technician's license in amateur radio um you can take a bunch of practice tests online get a technician's license uh pretty easy to do um i'm working on getting an upgraded license it was a little bit harder for me because i'm not a radio expert um so um so yeah i'm i'm looking at upgrading that license um but the, the first stage, the technician's license, is really not that hard to get. And I definitely recommend it, especially if you're into technology and coding and things like that. Because you can do a lot with, um, with coding and programming and technology with radio signals that has nothing to do with voice. So if you're not into the voice thing and you don't, like the, and you don't want to talk to people on the radio, that's fine. I mean, if you're into it, that's fine too. But if you're, if you're not into it, don't rule out a ham radio license just because you don't want to, you don't want to chat on the radio with somebody by voice a lot of stuff you can do with data so uh cell does not always work uh, uh i'm assuming that's definitively when there's a solar flare yeah i mean you've always got the uh, you know the worst case scenario if your if your cell phone dies um you know or there's some kind of natural disaster you can get an am you know get your radio amateur radio or your and uh still be able to communicate with people too so um so are you studying for a general license? Yeah, studying's a... Yeah, I, I use the term studying loosely. Uh, I am trying to get the general license. I'm 
loosely studying for the, the, the so FPV for drones if you know about that first person view feeds to Google or to goggles to Google's to goggles yeah definitely I mean all kinds of radio you can do video transmissions with uh, with the amateur radio frequencies uh, so yeah a lot of stuff you can do other than the voice stuff and I'm again I'm not knocking the voice stuff I just anytime I bring up the ham radio license people uh, I almost think about it like a CB radio, you know, they they just pick up the thing and they're like, oh, yeah, hello, hello. Um, but it's more than that. I mean, you can do that kind of stuff, but it, it's so much more than that. Um, so, well, all right, I'm tempted to kind of stick around. Oh. Because we're gonna we're gonna burst soon, and then we got about forty minutes until landing. So, your, <laughs> your explanation of studying reminds me of high school. Yeah, uh, yeah that's about right. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not really studying for the license that much. I take a couple practice tests every couple of weeks, and I'm not passing them consistently yet. Uh, I still get about a sixty percent, so I got some more work to do. But uh, yeah, at some point, I'd like to get my general license. So. Um, yeah, so I, uh, here's what I'm thinking, what I want to do, because when this thing bursts, I'm going to have to book it out of here in a hurry. So how are we going to do this? I don't know. Yeah, so now I'm, hmm. I'm just looking at my car, trying to think this one through. This is a little bit different because um, because it's so short, I would normally be on the road by now, and I wouldn't keep the broadcast going this long. We've been going for an hour after launch, so is burst altitude dependent? Um, kind of. It's mostly dependent on the size of the balloon we chose, and the balloon we chose is a very small balloon, um, so it's not going to go very high. We chose it to be very small because I really had no idea if this was even going to work. Um, so as the balloon rises in the atmosphere, it stretches and expands due to the decreased pressure. So there's less air around. The balloon needs to expand so that it can displace the same amount of air and continue to be buoyant. Because that's how things actually rise in the atmosphere. The, the balloon needs to displace the same amount of air mass or more than its own mass and then when it does then it will rise in the atmosphere so as the atmosphere gets thinner the balloon needs to get bigger in order to continue to displace that air mass so um, the smaller balloon it doesn't stretch as far so at some point when it gets too stretched out it will break it's intentional supposed to and then it will parachute back down so a very small balloon today 200 grams it's like um, I forget what it is, like 15% or something like that of what the last balloon we flew, which was 1,500 grams. Um, so, yeah, much smaller, much, much smaller balloon today. Um, so we're expecting max altitude in um, at about 75,000 feet. We're sitting at uh, 59,000 feet right now. So we're at about 60,000, just under 60,000 feet, and we're rising. So... Let's see. Uh, some ham radio discussion going on. Um, let's see. Did you give this setup a name? Falcon 9 Superlight? Uh, we call, so our flight today is called Shrimpy. Shrimpy, to follow along with our hashtag Space Lobster theme, and also because a little bitty tiny payload today. It's a little shrimp. So hashtag Space Shrimp. Um, that's the uh, shrimpy is the name of the flight today. So, all right. Here's what I'm thinking. Um, yeah, Andrew said just go eat and then come back on the live feed. I think that's what I'm going to do. So here's my plan. I'm starving. I hadn't eaten anything. If I would have thought this through, I would have eaten beforehand. But I wasn't planning on broadcasting this long. So my thought is I'm going to go grab some food real quick. I'm going to keep the broadcast up. We'll keep it going here on the um, on the map so you can see what's happening. Um, I will come back in a few minutes. We'll watch it go through burst. And then once it bursts, I'm going to have to book it out of here so I can go find it. And then I will, I'll end the broadcast at that point and we'll finish the broadcast on Facebook only. We'll be part two of the broadcast. So you got to go to overlookhorizon.com slash Facebook 
for part two of the broadcast. And uh, then uh, when that's when that's all done and over with, then um, I don't know what I was going to say there. I don't know if I had anything to say. But anyway, so I'm going to grab food. I'll come back to the map here in a minute. McDonald's drive through Yeah, I, I wish I could, but there's nothing in that direction. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna go grab something to eat. It only take me a minute. I'm actually I'm, I'm right here. I just gotta go off the screen. So we're gonna keep the map up. Let me just eat something real quick. <laughs> it's an awkward thing to talk about on a live broadcast. Listen, I'm gonna eat. You guys all hang out here by yourself, <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna come back. So we're gonna keep the map up. We keep an eye on it. I'll grab some food. Come back in a minute. Or, uh, you know, two or three minutes here. I also gotta need something to drink. I didn't bring anything to drink with me. I've just been talking for now two and a half hours straight. So, um, so let me go. Uh, let me go do that. I'll come back. We'll watch the burst, and then when that happens, I'm going to book it out of here, and we'll finish and do part two of the broadcast, Facebook only. Um, so we'll have that um, for the recovery out in the field. So, um, yeah, that sounds like a plan. That's my plan. Hope you like it. So I'm going to kill. I'm going to kill my feed, and then I'll come back in a few minutes, and we'll talk some more and watch the burst happen. All right. We'll see you in a couple of minutes.
Okay, we're coming back here. Let me get back on the screen. So, short break. Um, telemetry stopped updating. BW Timmer says, yeah, so we had balloon burst. Balloon burst was early, about 65,000 65, feet, not 75,000 feet. So balloon burst has happened. We stopped receiving telemetry here, which is not unheard of. Or, you know, it's because it, it is falling pretty fast, and the antenna is probably waving like crazy, probably having a hard time broadcasting. Hopefully the batteries are still with it. And they didn't just completely come dislodged. But we had balloon burst, and I got no more telemetry. I'm hoping it comes back. No update. Balloon has burst. Balloon has bursted. Uh, we, it could just be a temporary issue. It's just falling and the payload's going crazy. Hopefully it's nothing, no big deal. Could have also dislodged the batteries and killed the thing. Um, I'm hoping that's not the case. So we're gonna keep an eye on APRS. Uh, I'm gonna jump in the car. Oh, I don't even know. Do I jump in the car if I don't know where it's going? I guess I ought to wait and see. What, I guess I ought to see if I at least get a positioning report of some sort. I mean, it should, first couple minutes through the, atmos through the upper atmosphere is gonna fall pretty quickly. 64,000 feet, uh, our, our highest altitude reading. Uh, let's see if I can get back to it. Highest altitude was like, there it is, 64,388 feet. And then it started coming back down. We got one broadcast after it came down and then nothing after that. That's a little bit strange because it did drop, you know, I mean, I would think if the balloon burst caused the whole thing to go foobar. Um, although, oh, I didn't even see this. Somebody said, yeah, the temperature dropped to, temperature dropped to negative 49 degrees. Certainly possible that maybe the temperature had an issue here. Oh, wait a minute. Oh no, just kidding. Ah, got myself excited. Ugh. No, still same, no change. So it's possible that maybe our batteries are having an issue. Remember, we're it's falling through the atmosphere pretty quickly now. Those batteries may have may have gotten super chilled. It might be causing an issue. Um, I guess here's here's something we can check um, just to see if it's alive and maybe it just need. Uh, See if I can get any more info here. Nope, last transmission heard, 1716. Oh boy, I hope that's not the end of it. We we're doing so well, so well. And then balloon burst at 64,000, 65,000 feet, somewhere in that range. Oh man, got nothing so far. And I don't, well, I was going to jump in the car and start booking it, but I didn't even really get to eat, <laughs> like I said I was going to, because um, I saw that burst happen. And we haven't had anything since then. All right, well, well, that's our status right now, which is not looking good, but we're not completely, we're not completely dead in the water here. So... I'm probably going to jump in the car and head that direction. I'm going to... I'll keep the map running here on this live broadcast. So, this live broadcast... My plan is I am not going to end this broadcast because I actually don't have to clean up this stuff. I can just leave it right here. So, I'm going to let this live broadcast continue. I am going to start another live broadcast on Facebook in... Uh, it'll probably be about 10 or 15 minutes. So, head over to facebook.com slash Overlook Horizon. I'm gonna start another live broadcast. Once I, I'm gonna get in the car, get going down the road, find a spot, stop, and then we'll start a live broadcast there um, while we're out on mobile. So I'm gonna keep this one going. Status now, balloon broke, payload stopped transmitting. Hopefully not for good, hopefully it comes back. 
We'll have to see what happens. So I will uh, we'll start that Facebook broadcast soon. Um, so head over to facebook.com slash Overlook Horizon to uh, follow along with us. But in the meantime, I'm going to keep this one running, so maybe we'll see if, if the map changes or anything happens. Um, and I'm going to... Well, I'm going to at least get prepared to jump in the car um, and probably try to ch see if I can find it here in a few minutes. So, all right, I'll come, I'll say, I'll come back in a minute here before I actually head out and tell you what the final plan is. But I think that's my plan. I'm going to jump in the car shortly and broadcast on Facebook. So we'll keep this going for a few more minutes. And I guess if, it, if nothing comes back, then I guess there's no reason to keep this broadcast going because I got nothing to show other than the map. So... Keep this here for a minute until I'm ready to go, and then, uh, I don't know, cross our fingers. Let's hope it, hope it comes back. All right, everybody. Um, we're not looking good here. Um, got no transmission for the last 15 minutes here from the balloon. Um, don't know what happened. I 
uh, I'm hoping it comes back to life. You know, I'm thinking that it's possible that, well, I guess the two possible, er, three possibilities here. Three, two, yeah, three possibilities. Possibility number one, batteries froze and the Arduino doesn't have enough power at the moment. That's an okay thing because maybe it'll come back to life. Possibility number two, the uh, um, the antenna is waving wildly on the descent and is not able to send an effective signal. That might be all right if I get closer with my antenna and try to uh, receive it locally. We're going to try that. Possibility number three is something else broke, which would not be good because that would probably be permanent. Permanent uh, end of mission there. But <clears throat> here's since the map's not updating, um, since the map's not updating, there's really no sense in me continuing this broadcast at least. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to end this one. I'm going to get in the car. I'm going to head a little closer, see if I can pick something up with my antenna. And um, you guys head over to uh, facebook.com slash Overlook Horizon. Uh, probably won't be like immediate, but be a little intermission here and then uh, probably in about 15, 15 or 20 minutes or so as I get a little closer I'm going to start a live broadcast um, over by where the predicted landing is so we're going to see uh, see what happens. So I'm hopeful that either the batteries just died and it might come back or um, uh, what was the, the other thing I was going to say or the antenna um, is just having an issue. So because I may still be able to pick it up. So, I'm on the road. I'm heading out. Thanks, everybody, for watching this broadcast. Appreciate it. We had a lot of fun, at least, hanging around here. I'm going to cut it short now and get on the road. Facebook.com slash Overlook Horizon. See you in about 15 or 20 minutes. Thanks, guys.